Uh, brethren, a very warm welcome to you all. It's again a pleasure to see you all on here today. Um, as usual, I'll start with my boring housekeeping. Um, the meeting is being recorded, as you just had heard, and will be posted onto our YouTube page. Therefore, those of you who do not wish to be seen, please feel free to turn your videos off. Um, to avoid any disruptions during the talk, if you could also please ensure that your mics are kept on mute throughout, that would be much appreciated. There will be an open Q&A session after the talk. If you'd like to ask a question, please use the hand up icon, which can be found in the participants tab on Zoom and wait for your name to be called out. Please, please, please do not use the reactions button because it's impossible to see everybody um, unless you use the participants um, hand up icon. Thank you. Um, to give everyone a chance to ask their question, please, we request that you do keep it to one per person. Now we are giving away, which I forgot to do last week, we are giving away this week four of our bespoke mugs. So we missed out two from last week. And the question is, how many books has Dr. David Harrison written? If you could write your answers down in the chat section, as always, and the first four correct answers will win. Brethren, it is now my pleasure to hand over the reins to Dr. David Harrison. Thank you very much. Yeah. Do you, do you want me to answer that question? How many, how many, how many books have written? No, you get a mug anyway, so don't please, don't bother. <laughs> oh, that's all right. That's all right. Right, well, thank you uh, for that introduction. And um, uh, just bear in mind the time that you mentioned previously. Uh, I'd just like to introduce the paper. And um, it was edited from uh, one of my books uh, of the same title, The Lost Rights. Uh, the Lost Rituals of uh, Freemasonry, and um, it was uh, edited because I, I was presenting papers around lodges at the time, and um, and obviously cut it down to about 30 minutes, so you know it's going to be about a 30 minute talk, um, so therefore it kind of looks at um, five or six or seven of these so-called Lost Rites, uh, but obviously we can bring in a few more uh, later on. And um, in the in the question and answers a bit later, and also um, just just to say that the paper's uh, free to download. There's a there's a bigger version of the paper, and it's free to download from my academia uh, site, which is Google Run. So if you just type my name in Google, it, it'll just come up, and you can download the the whole paper. So uh, I just thought I'd mention that as well, and uh, the book itself is available with Lewis Masson. Right, so I shall begin. So David, just before you do start, if I could just ask you to uh, just start the slideshow, which is the top, in the top there. Yeah. Uh, there'll be a better layout on the screen itself. Right, so can you? Yeah, if you go and go up, go that one there, just up above, where the, see where the arrow is above that, just there. That there. Yeah. The, yeah. Yeah. You click on that, that should start the slide and then you can move it as you please. Right, how's that? Is that okay? Is it on? Yes, perfect. Thank yeah. you. Excellent, fantastic. Right, so I shall begin. Uh, in my book, The Genesis of Freemasonry, I put forward how Dr. Jean Theophilus Desagulier was responsible for creating the third degree sometime in the 1720s. Before this, there were two parts being performed, the Entered Apprentice and the Fellow Craft. The new three degree style ritual soon spread and it seemed that Freemasons soon wanted to explore deeper pathways within Freemasonry, leading to new ideas being developed. Chevalier Ramsey was a Jacobite Freemason who had gone to France to tutor the sons of aristocrats and in his Masonic address of 1737, he famously outlined that Freemasonry was linked to the Crusaders and chivalric orders. His oration put forward that after being preserved in the British Isles, he was transported to France. And though there is no evidence that masonry was ever associated in any way to the Crusaders or chivalry, it does show that at the time, there was a developing interest in chivalric orders in relation to Freemasonry. Though Ramsey did not set out any plans for new chivalric Masonic orders in his oration, his address certainly assisted to inspire them. The craft rituals of this time were far from standardized, and this created liberty to explore new stories, to create sequels to the Hiramic legend and the building of the temple. 
All this was happening during a time when English Freemasonry became split and was arguing over how the royal art should fit into the system. On the continent, however, there is indeed a rich and fascinating tapestry in regards to the development of Masonic rites, some of which can be linked together during this heady manic period for access to high degrees in the 18th and early 19th centuries. As a Masonic historian, Lionel Simungal once wrote, the surviving degrees and orders are the distilled essence of the past. The lifeblood of some of these degrees that, were, that we practice today, having their origins in these lost degrees. With the egos of the men behind them and a dangerous blend of politics, magic and power, Freemasonry was taken into a very experimental place, a place where we will now explore. So the first rite I'd like to introduce you to is uh, perhaps one of the most famous, uh, the rite of strict observance. There was a strong desire to extend the themes explored in the craft rituals, and there were plenty of charismatic characters that were eager to create or promote new orders and grades, based on the continuation of the themes for the search for lost knowledge. One such charismatic in individual was Baron Karl Gotthelf von Hunt, who in around 1754 founded the rite of strict observance in Germany. Baron von Hunt had put forward that he had been initiated into a mysterious Masonic order of the temple in Paris in 1742, and that his secret knowledge had been gained from unknown superiors. The rite of strict observance became a rather popular rite spreading to many other European countries, such as Switzerland, Holland, Denmark, and Russia, and included the tantalizing seven degrees, offering the philosophy of progression to willing Freemasons. These seven degrees, according to the transcription of the Schroeder rituals by Alan Bernheim and Arturo de Hoyas, include the first craft degrees of apprentice, fellow, and master mason, followed by Scots master, secular novice, knight, and finally, lay brother. The three craft rituals are recognizable, perhaps to any mason, but nonetheless have stark differences, such as in the master mason's degree, which features a cassia branch instead of the acacia sprig, as we know of today. A collection of catechisms are presented that seem quite unusual in certain contexts, and it appears that the rituals evolved down a very different path still retained the essence of the first three degrees. The rite was templar orientated, the chivalric content and the mystery that surrounded its origin still tantalizing Masonic historians today. The translations of Bernheim and de Hoyas in discussing the extracts from the history of the order present a story of how a number of Templars fled persecution in France in 1311 and arrived in Scotland clothed as Masons. According to the story, once in Scotland, the order continued with the usages of masonry chosen to preserve the memory and that nobody was admitted a Scots master other than a child of the order. The rite in celebrating Scotland and its secret temple heritage seems to echo the chivalric ideas presented to the oration of Chevalier Ramsay, something that was also mirrored in the rite's suggestion of a mysterious Jacobite source. Indeed, Baron von Hunt's undoing was the mysterious origin of the rite, and being unable to present any tangible proof of his unknown superiors, a result of which his story became untenable and his reputation damaged. He died in 1776 in much reduced circumstances, and at the convent of Wilhelmsbad in 1782, von Hunt's rite quickly unraveled as a collection of delegates renounced the unproven Templar origins. They discarded the myth and a complete reworking of the ritual took place, ending the practice of von Hunt's rite of strict observance. Some Masonic writers, such as Arthur Edward Waite, have made reference of the supposed Jacobite origins of von Hunt's rite. And in Paris, von Hunt believed he came into contact with a certain Knight of the Red Feather, whose identity was never revealed, but von Hunt believed was none other than the young pretender Charles Edward Stuart himself. Waite was of the opinion that Von Hunt was mistaken or deceived. But either way, the Baron maintained his story until his death, and the right of strict observance was, 
for a short while, one of the most progressive rights in Europe during the 18th century. Despite the end of the practice of von Hunt's right of strict observance, its restructuring by Jean-Baptiste Willemos led to the birth of the rectified Scottish right, which will be discussed in a little more depth later on. And the right of strict observance also became an influence on the right of Philolethus and the right of seven degrees, which was practiced in London in the 1770s and 1780s. So, uh, and that's a picture there of um, Baron von Hunt, looking quite dandy. Um, the next right I'd like to introduce you to um, is the Order of Gold and Rosy Cross. The Order of the Gold and Rosy Cross, which was founded in Germany in the 1750s, was perhaps one of the most mysterious, esoteric Masonic orders that came into being. The principal founder of the order was the alchemist Hermann Fichtel, and indeed, alchemy was a fundamental part of the teachings of the order. Only Master Masons were considered to be members, and the order attracted a number of influential German Freemasons, such as George Foster, and that's a portrait of George Foster there. Foster was a leading intellectual figure of the Enlightenment. He had accompanied his father, Johann Reynold Foster, on Captain Cook's second voyage, whose duty was to record and write a scientific report of the voyage discoveries. And this led to the publication of the all-time classic, A Voyage Around the World, on their return. George Foster went on to become a fellow of the Royal Society and worked in a number of German universities, later embracing the French Revolution and becoming a leading light in the formation of the Mainz Republic. He died in exile in Paris in 1794. King Frederick Wilhelm II of Prussia was also involved in the Order of Rosy Cross, the king being friends with the Freemason Voltaire and surrounding himself with artists, writers and musicians, as well as supporting science. Frederick William was said to have been a firm believer in the healing power of an elixir that was only known to the Order. So the next right that I'd like to introduce is uh, something that you might be quite familiar with. This is another famous right of the uh, of the 1700s, and this is uh, Cagliostro's Egyptian right. And of all the Masonic rites that existed on the continent during the 18th century, Count Alessandro Cagliostro's Egyptian right is perhaps one of the most intriguing and fascinating. Cagliostro himself was a man of mystery, ego, and of creativity. The theatre of Freemasonry being the backdrop to portray the themes of alchemy and magic, and something that appealed to many at the time. Cagliostro became the romantic subject of writers such as Johann Wolfgang van Goethe and Alexandre Dumas, and the romance surrounding his life seems to blur between fantasy and reality, creating an almost mythical Masonic character. For example, Cagliostro allegedly met illustrious 18th century personalities such as the Comte de Saint-Germain and Casanova, and Cagliostro's past was as mysterious as these two figures, the magician being identified as Giuseppe Balsamo, an Italian forger and trickster. While in France in the 1780s, Cagliostro was implicated in the affair of the diamond necklace, which involved Marie Antoinette, and after spending some time in the Bastille, he was released, released and left for England, later leaving for Rome, where he was arrested for being a Freemason in 1789. After trying to escape from the Castel Sant'Angelo, Cagliastro was moved to the fortress of San, San Leo, where he died soon after. And Cagliastro became such an important figure in Freemasonry at the time that he was invited to the Convention of Paris in 1784 to explain his system, a convention that the right of the Philolethes, that we mentioned previously, had been instrumental in organizing. His claim included that he could renew youth he could conjure the apparitions of the dead. He could bestow beauty on those who submitted to his system of hermetic medicine and that he could make gold. In short, his right would reveal the true hidden mysteries of nature and science. And as it became open to women, he began to attract a number of high ranking ladies. So that was uh, Cagliostro's Egyptian right. And now I'd like to introduce you to the Swedenborg right, some of you might have 
heard of this. Um, it's been written about in various different uh, sources, in, including uh, Arthur Edward Waite. Uh, some of you might be uh, a fan of his work. So Emanuel Swedenborg has never been proven to be a Freemason. He was, however, a mystic, theologian, philosopher, scientist, and inventor, whose teachings and work inspired the Swedenborg Rite. Emanuel Swedenborg was born in Stockholm in 1688, his father being a professor of theology at Uppsala University and later Bishop of Skara. Swedenborg was a learned man, inventing flying machines, researching anatomy, and undertaking many different studies into various aspects of learning, being a propagator in the search for the hidden mysteries of nature and science. It was later in life that Swedenborg had a spiritual awakening, awakening of sorts, which witnessed a transition from a man of science to a mystic, a man who could talk to angels, spirits, and demons, and who could uh, discuss the second coming of Christ and the last judgment. Swinnerbog died in London in 1772, and he went on to inspire eminent artists and writers, such as the poet William Blake and Thomas de Quincey, as well as fellow men of mysticism, such as Louis Claude de Saint Martin, who we'll mention a little about later on. It was after his death that the Swedenborg Rite was developed by a Polish count and Swedenborg enthusiast called Thaddeus Lazanski Grabianka and Dom Antoine Joseph Panetti fusing Swedenborg's mystical teachings with certain Masonic ideas. Don Antoine Joseph Panetti had left the Benedict order and after settling in Avignon, pursued his interest in alchemy. He then relocated to Berlin, becoming library, becoming uh, the librarian to Frederick the Great, someone else who's also been linked to Freemason. And while there, he translated Swedenborg's works into French. It was in Berlin that Panetti met the Polish Count Thaddeus Lazanski Grabianka. And after Panetti returned to Avignon, Grabianki joined him, and they both founded the Society de Illumina de Avignon in 1786. This so called Swedenborg Rite was relatively short lived, coming to an end in the wake of the chaos brought by the French Revolution. They did, however, attract two English Swedenborgians of note. William Bryan and John Wright, who in 1789 were initiated into the mysteries of their order and were introduced to the actual and personal presence of the Lord, who was conveyed by a majestic young man in purple garments, seated on a throne, situated in an inner chamber decorated with heavenly emblems. And this hints that the Wright reflected the millennialism philosophies of Swedenborg, but that the rest of the ritual was like we can only speculate. Another Swedenborg rite surfaced with the occult revival in the later 19th century, again containing elements of Swedenborg's mystical millennialism. And that later um, incarnation of the, um, uh, the Swedenborg rite was um, directed by John Yarker, who some of you might be familiar with, um, who's, who was an esoteric Freemason um, and kind of journeyed into the occult fringes, if you like, um, in the later part of his career. So um, I, I'll, I'll skip Jean-Baptiste Willemos for a second and go straight to Martinez de Pasquale uh, with the Rite de Ella Cohen. Now Martinez de Pasquale established his Rite de Ella Cohen, or the Rite of Elect Priesthood at Toulouse in 1760. And the Rite had nine degrees divided into three divisions. And these included the porch, which were basically the three craft degrees, the temple, which were the chivalric degrees, and the shrine, which were more magical. And Pasquale merged esoteric doctrines based on Gnosticism and the Kabbalah, and in short, his version of Freemasonry blending with magic to form a unique type of rite. In this sense, the teachings of the Rite de Ella Coer enabled its members to learn an aspect of magic their aim to place the adept in communion with supernatural beings. Pasquale was particularly influential on Jean Baptiste Willemoz and Louis Claude de Saint Martin, both taking his teachings in different directions. And when Pasquale died in 1774, elements of the rite 
were absorbed into the reconstructed right for strict observance by Willemos, creating the rectified Scottish rite, and his teachings went on to influence Martinism. And when we look at John Dee and Edward Kelly in the 1500s and their system of communicating with angels, it was very similar to the work that was conducted almost two centuries later by certain members of the Ella Cohen. And was certainly reminiscent of Swedenborg's mystical beliefs, the search for lost knowledge being dominated by in part of these rites. Willemos received training as a member of the Ella Cohen by Pasquale himself, training that took place outside the lodge and was not part of any lodge room working. And I'll just go back to uh, John Baptiste Willemos there. And this was to be practiced alone and in private. Despite this, the training was an essential part of Pasquale's teachings. And between 1768 and 1772, Willemos received instructions from Pasquale in a cult on magical procedure. These included not eating meat, conducting the ritual at the beginning of either equinox, the ritual to be performed at midnight and to wear particular clothing while being divested of metals, which of course reminds us of what takes place in the first degree. A circle of retreat was to be drawn in the west side of the room with the proper inscriptions at the proper points, with the symbols and wax tapers, with a segment of a circle drawn on the east side of the room. After lighting all the tapers, the name of God was supplicated and the names of the inscribed angels were recited, being asked to grant that which was desired. However, in spite of his dedication, Willemos only reported seeing visions of colours, sparks and got goosebumps, ultimately becoming dissatisfied with the results. His close friend and colleague, San Martin, otherwise known as the unknown philosopher, believed that there could be a direct communion between man and God and had a little more success with these magic proceedings. And he came to the conclusion that we are all Christ's. So I'll just fast forward there to uh, Louis Claude de Saint Martin to give you a, um, a profile picture of him. So around 1770, Pasquale gave Willemos further instructions because they didn't work the first time. Really. So with the circle of retreat being located in the center of the room, well, by 1772, Pasquale left for San Domingo never to return. And as weight enigmatically puts forward, I do not doubt that Willemos and his circle received psychic communications. Willemos and San Martin's explorations, the search for lost knowledge, pushing the boundaries of this world and that of the next. As Arthur Edward Waite reminds us, the ceremonial magic of the elect priesthood is by no means fully available. And there were certain invocations and descriptions that were not entirely written down. So the little we do know gives us but a glimpse of Pasquale's occult workings. And we do know, however, that part of their doctrine featured a belief system of the fall of man and the restoration of man as a divine agent and being able to commune directly with God himself. So that brings the, uh, the paper to an end. And um, I'd just like to round off by saying that the many more um, rights that were in circulation during the later 18th century and um, uh, I, I think there's a there was a list posted around on the actual poster that was making the uh, the rounds on social media but there's there's quite a long list of these so-called lost rights and one of the reasons why I call them lost was mainly because um, there was a lack of con continuity really um, a lot of these rites came to their natural conclusion, their natural end in the later 18th century and the early 19th century. But some of you might be um, familiar with other ones like Memphis Mizraim and, and uh, many, many, many more. Um, Melusino's rite is another one, for example. Um, there was um, uh, ooh, many, many different rites, the rites of Zinnendorf. Um, so, um, yeah, the Bulk of those rights are explained in my book anyway. 
So um, that might uh, interest you further if uh, you're keen to find out more. But now I'll pass you over to uh, the host and see if there's any questions. David, thank you ever so much. Um, I feel like we need to do a little mini series on this. Um, I think there's a lot more probably that we can discuss and can talk about, but thank you ever so much for that, um, or should I say, beginning of a series. That'd be, um, yeah, we, good. Yeah. That'd be great. Um, we have got questions. Uh, if we could go to uh, Terry. Hi, Terry. Hi there. Um, David, uh, it's nice to meet you in person because I actually subscribe to academia and I see your name so many times come up with different bits of papers that you've done. And thank you very much for a very interesting talk. That's all I've got to say. It's not a question, but I'd like to thank you for that. Thank you very much. Yes, yeah, a pleasure. Thank you. Wonderful. Good could, to meet you. Um, could I go next to Josson George, please, in India? Hi, Josson. Good evening. Good evening. Um, so, your question was too long for me to ask. So, okay. uh, sure. My question is that I would have supposed that the British, with their organizational systems being based on bureaucracy and systems, in, they usually would have brought a degree of compartmentalization in the progressive degrees as compared to uh, USA. However, what we see today in the USA is that all the progressive degrees, other than the mainline ones, have been brought into two bodies. It's either the AMD, where you have the RAM and uh, the OSM and all the degrees come under the AMD, or it's under the Grand College of Rights uh, for those orders which have been abandoned or put into cold storage. Mm -hmm. And uh, in the USA, we rarely find new degrees rarely emerging. However, in the UK, under UGLE, we see uh, old orders which have been abandoned suddenly resurrecting like the scarlet cord or you find new orders suddenly appearing like the order of uh, alfred now my question to a uh, question is uh, what is your opinion on new orders being created and old uh, defunct orders being res resurrected um i think it's great because um since since i've joined i mean i've i've, I've been a freemason for about 22 years now uh, but it, in those 22 years um, I've, I've seen um, a lot of, a lot younger people more younger than me coming in and and they they're very much into the esoteric stuff the spiritual stuff um, which is obviously con controversial with with UGLE anyway um, but I've, I've seen so many young guys come in and 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 they certainly want these these old degrees they want to experience them they they want to um find out what it's all about um and they want to read about it they you know they want to learn about it they want to get involved as well so i i personally think it's quite good because it attracts a lot of people in and um um yeah it's great i think really you know and and it, and it gives options and it, and it gives more scope uh, what about degrees sorry what about new orders the new orders, yeah. Um, well, yeah. I, again, you know, um, you you do find them coming through, and um, there's obviously um, in in my book, for example, one of my themes is that Freemasons always want more. Um, you know, they always desire more, and that's that's true throughout Masonic history. You know, you can see all the degrees growing and growing. That's why these rites ca came along, because they contained. Uh, seven degrees in a right or nine degrees in a right you know and and so it gave these masons at the time on the continent to experiment and to find out more and, and to become involved and and you know to not bother about promotions you know uh, I think when when I came into Freemasonry anyway you know um, it was dominated by obviously an older set who were more interested in promotions you know um, you know, pr uh, provincial honours and things like that and Grand Lodge honours. But the younger people that have come in, you know, over the past 20 years are more interested in these degrees and more interested in the esoteric knowledge and they're more interested in finding out more and um, trying out these orders, be it, be it new or 
you know, maybe getting involved in the Grand College of Rights and reading, just, just reading about them, you know. So I, I think it's fascinating and it's part of Masonic education and it's part of a new pathway. Uh, well, like a revived pathway in a way, you know. Thanks a lot. You've sort of reassured me. Thanks a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, <laughs> Jobson. <laughs> um, next, could we go to Brother Paul Greek, please? Hi, Paul. Hi, I'm in. Hi Dave, uh, David. Thank you for that talk. I still don't quite understand why um, in those times there were so many different rights that were started up as opposed to um, expanding on mainstream Freemasonry. Um, well, I think the main reason was, um, well, there's a few reasons really. One, you've got these char charismatic characters like um, Baron von Hunt and uh, Count Cagliostro, um, uh, Martinez Pasquale, very strong, charismatic characters that wanted to put together their idea of the pathway of Freemasonry, where, where their version of Freemasonry should go. So you had Cagliostro, who was probably making a bit of money on the side as well. Um, he was blending all kinds of ideas. The Egyptian stuff was going in, bit of magic, bit of alchemy. Um, you had uh, Pasquale with this kind of um, almost spiritual essence where he was um, having this side uh, work where they were getting in contact with angels and spirits and things. Um, and you had Von Hunt that wanted a solid kind of Templar structure, uh, which became very, very su uh, successful and obviously morphed into many different directions you know, with the, with the Swedish right and, and uh, the rectified Scottish right. Um, so one, you had these charismatic figures, very strong figures, and the, there was plenty of them around on, on the continent. Um, two, there was a lot of room for experimentation on the continent. Um, so they could kind of uh, adopt all manner of ideas in relation to Freemasonry and put them together. Uh, where in England, for example, there was a bit more restriction even though you had three Grand Lodges at the time, there was still a bit of restriction. There was a bit of ordered restriction, you know, so you had the modern Grand Lodge, the ancients, they were squabbling over the Royal Arch as well. Um, and then you had the York Grand Lodge, which was very localized, very Northern, um, in, mainly based in Yorkshire and a bit of Lancashire. Um, but um, yeah, it's very, if you, if you look at what they were doing, they were very structured and very ordered. On the continent, there was a lot of room for experimentation. Um, I suppose in those early days, um, it was before mainstream Freemasonry really got underway. So. Oh yeah, 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 definitely. Yeah, I mean, I mean, this mainstream idea, um, uh, you've got to put that to one side because in the 18th century, it was very fluid and um, there was a lot of room for experimentation, uh, for uh, transmutation. You know, there was like, like, for example, in England at the time, um, in England and Wales, you had many different styles of craft lodges. You had table lodges, um, where the ceremony took place around a, a long table and then maybe broke off, had a meal, poured a bit of wine, broke a bit of bread and then carried on, you know? So, and then you had craft rituals that, that didn't have table lodges. So you had very, you know, various different, uh, you know, kind of ideas that were floating around then, you know? Um, so in the 18th century, it was very fluid. Um, there was a lot of break-offs, for example. I mean, we have here we have the mo the moderns, the ancients, the York, um, and um, besides the influence of the Irish and the, and the Scottish as well, you know. So, um, but the continent was this kind of um, kind of breeding ground, really, for uh, for these rites, and you get some very colourful rites, uh, Bavarian Illuminati, for example. Um, is another one, um, the um, eclectic right, you know, uh, there's so many. Um, uh, the Dracovic observance in Croatia and Hungary. Um, so yeah, you know, it's, it was a fertile breeding ground really, you know, for- Great, thank you, Paul. Ideas. Thanks, um, David. Thank you. Next, could we go to Simon? Hi, Simon, reader. Hello, um, thanks for that. It's given, given lots of, uh, little snippets i heard some words in there that were sort of close and slightly changed i think uh, i'm going to need to do a lot more investigation in a few of those things for some of the connections but 
It's right on my question, actually. Um, I, hopefully, I wrote this down right. I think it was uh, Cagliostros. Um, he got arrested. Yeah, he got arrested for being a Freemason. Yeah. <laughs> where, was, where was that criminal? And how was that criminal? Oh, that well, that was in Italy. Uh, he went to Rome and got and got got arrested there. Um, it was quite dangerous at the time, um, you know, with the um, uh, papal bulls and things like that. And and um, um, one of the most famous ones to actually get get himself arrested. I, I've forgotten his name now. Um, um, oh, what's his name? Um, it'll come to me in a flash. Uh, I've got that that much going on in my mind at the moment. There was uh, a guy in Portugal in the 1740s and um, and he got arrested in uh, he by the Sp uh, the Spanish in um, Inquisition and tortured and uh, and he wrote a book about it and uh, I mentioned him in the book as well. But um, Cag Cagliostro was another famous one that was arrested. I mean, he, he, he was a very dodgy figure as well. Um, David, it wasn't John Custos, was it? Yeah, yeah John, John Custos, yeah, thank you. That, thank that, you, uh, Pierre Salim, thank you, brother. John Custos, yeah, yeah, that's right. And he, he got arrested also in Portugal. Um, so some, some of these countries, these Catholic countries, you know, it's very dangerous, you know, to be a Freemason. Um, and but with Cagliostro as well, he he was known as a, a rather dodgy figure. Um, he's he had a very dodgy fat past. He was he was quite well known when he when he came to London in the uh, the seventeen eighties. Um, he actually gave a talk to the Lodge of Antiquity, and um, they they mocked him. You know they. They kind of mocked him for, for for being what he what they thought he was, you know, a trickster and a forger, and a thief, um, and he kind of left in shame. Really, he left England in shame. He, he had to write a, a pamphlet, which was pleading to the people, you know, to believe him, you know, um, and every everywhere he went, he caused trouble. You know, he was in Paris, and there was um, issues there with the affair of the diamond necklace and. All, all, all kinds of things. He was put in the Bastille. So, you know, he, he was a bit of a dodgy character. And, uh, <laughs> might, might have been an excuse, some of it, but fair enough. Probably, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thank you Thanks, very much. Um, David, we've got one final question um, from an unnamed brother. Um, if anyone was to practice these rites, would we fall foul of United Grand Lodge of England nowadays? <laughs> Most probably, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, the... The best thing about these rights is that recently some of them have re-emerged and uh, like the right to strict observance um, has popped up in the south of France. Um, uh, I'm just having my, my first book, Genesis of Freemasonry, uh, translated into French for um, an edition there. And so I've got to know a few French Freemasons through that and they've told me about this and, you know, and, and there's like, you know, there's Memphis Misraim that's still going on. Um, which again is still still very fluid. Uh, I mean, that's all over the place at the moment. You know, you you can go to France, you can go to Italy, Albania, wherever. You know, you, you you're going to find Memphis Misery, and depending where you go, you know, it, it could either have 97 degrees or 98 or 99 or 100. You know, um, so the, they are very fluid, and some of them have have popped up again. You know, the Bavarian Illuminati's popped up again. You know. Um, and, but you, you can find most of these uh, rituals in, in the Grand College of Rites. Um, so I suppose you could sign up to them, get some, you know, um, uh, issues of, of those editions and, you know, just do it in your bedroom or something, you know. <laughs> so, you know um, but, but they're there to see and to study now, which is great. You know, there's, there's a lot of translations of the original rituals coming through. Um, I've just I've just been told if you're going to do that, make sure the shades are down. Yeah, yeah, just close the curtains. Yeah. Close the curtains. Yeah, um, apparently in uh, in America, the United States, uh, it would be scorned upon as well. Um, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Viewed as clandestine and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Just read yeah. in the chat. There's nine rites being worked today in Brazil. Um, they do the rectified yeah. Scottish rite has been practiced there for the last twenty years, apparently. 
Thanks, Alan. Yeah, I mean, yeah, that's that's still quite oh. very uh, popular, really. Oh. You know, the gratified Scottish right is still still going strong. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Um, uh, St John's right as well is another one in Brazil, I believe, which which is a grandson of the uh, Dracovich Observance. Um, I've been informed. So uh, yeah, yeah, they do quite a few rights there in in Brazil. Um, in France, you know, uh, in places like Albania, you know, you know, you, you get Memphis Misraim that's knocking around and, and um, uh, the Bavarian Illuminati and all these kind of rights, you know, still pop up. Um, and, you know, in the Balkans and, and elsewhere, you know, it's, it's fascinating, really. You know. David, Always a market. Thank you ever so much. Um, I, th I feel like we need to do a bit more work together. So, um, if it's okay with you, I shall be giving you a call um, to go through a few bits, if that's okay. Yeah, yeah, I mean, you know, there's, there's, there's so many of these and it creates a lot of discussion and I, I could easily do, you know, three of these probably, you know. Sometimes. Perfect, perfect. I know we stretch for time, a little bit stretch for time today. Uh, brethren, before we go, I do want to call out um, brothers Andrew Armbrister, Peter Harland, Wayne Owens and Terry Fuller. Thank you very much. You all answered quickly, correctly, and I have your addresses and you'll be receiving a mug in the post within the next week or two. Thank you very much. What was much. the answer? Eight. Oh no, there's more than eight now. <laughs> well, at the time this went to publication, it was eight. <laughs> right, right. So well, that's, another mug, that's another mug coming to Dorset. <laughs> Do you, do you want me to give you the true answer now? Or Go for I, it. Uh, 12. You have 12? 12. Wow. Amazing. When yeah. was the last one that came out? Uh, the last one was uh, Rediscovered Rituals with Lewis Masonic. That came out in May. And that was um, uh, a, a disguised Masonic biography of Richard Carlyle, really. Um, uh, but it follows on from, from the Lost Rites book. Uh, because it, it examines his manual of Freemasonry, uh, which is something- And how many works. lectures would you say you've delivered? How many lectures? In lodges? Yes. In, in lodges? Yes, yes. Ooh, um, hundreds, I would think. <laughs> hundreds, yeah. Over, oh, over the years, yeah. I mean, um, I've, I've done all kinds of lodges, you know. Um, you know, you, you get letters off some of them, so, you know, of thanks and things like that. So, so you remember more than others, you know. Um, uh, yeah, I'd, I'd say probably a couple of hundred maybe over the years. Your name appears quite frequently on the Facebook. Uh, oh yeah, yeah. In the USA. Oh, right, right. Yeah, all, all good, I hope, yeah. <laughs> Brethren, um, thank you once again. Uh, we are on the same time next week, next Tuesday. We'll be posting out the speaker for next week um, along with the details. Uh, thank you ever so much for joining us. I'm a, apologies, it's a bit rushed today, but we do need to get on to our next call now. Um, but look, I bid you all good night. Keep safe. Keep smiling. Keep up the Freemasons. Well, peace to all. Good night. Good night, good night everybody. Good night, everyone. Thank you very much. Good night, everyone. Good night. Good night, yep. Giovanni. Good night, everyone. Good night. Good night, everyone. Interesting evening. Yes, yet again. Good night. <laughs> yep, thanks.